Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar Farmers Markets During COVID-19. This is a joint venture between University of Illinois Extension and the Illinois Farmers Market Association. My name is Lori George and I'm one of the U of I Local Food Systems Small Farm Educators housed in the Mount Vernon area. With all the changes that we've seen worldwide concerning COVID-19, there have been a lot of questions surrounding farmers markets. Should they open? Should they close? If you open, what things should you consider? What changes will be need to be made in order for the sell the product safely? These changes not only affect the market managers, but the market vendors and the customers as well. So our speakers today will be talking on these issues and more. They are all involved with farmers markets throughout Illinois and are here today to offer their assistance of what they have accomplished to make their markets safer for the 2020 season. But first, I'd like to introduce Jane Maxwell, Executive Director for the Illinois Farmers Market Association. Jane is very passionate about local food and farmers markets. She is a registered dietitian and works to promote the health and economic impact of local food and farmers markets. Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Lori, and thank you to the University of Illinois Extension for allowing us to uh, work with them on sharing these webinars. We're really excited to uh, be here today and to talk about re-envisioning farmers markets. I think the slide that uh, is the introductory slide is the, is the picture that's in our minds when we think about farmers markets. But I think for the 2020 season, we're going to be looking at uh, markets that are set up a little bit differently, run a little bit differently, and um, meet the statewide uh, guidance that we uh, respect social distancing and practice enhanced sanitation. This picture is actually not an Illinois market. This is from Portland, Maine, but it was a good example of what a farmer's market uh, might look like as we move into the 2020 season. First of all, I wanted to give you a little information about the Illinois Farmers Market Association. We are a statewide member-based not-for-profit. Uh, our website is ilfma.org. Uh, if you would like to stay in touch with ILFMA, especially during this time, uh, we recommend that you go to ilfma.org. And at the bottom of the page, there's a subscribe now field and subscribe there and you'll get our uh, updated newsletters and information and we'll try and stay in close touch during this time. Uh, we are a statewide uh, not-for-profit and uh, we would encourage you to, um, again, there is the COVID-19 uh, toolkit as well as the COVID-19 uh, resource pages. Another thing that we like to do during this uh, all the time, but is particularly important during this season, is that the Illinois Farmers Market Association has a Farmers Market Manager Network Facebook group. Uh, if you go to Facebook and find us, uh, we will approve your membership and then you can be part of the conversation and discussion, which might be especially helpful during this time. When COVID-19 hit and we were talking about what was going to be the impact on farmers markets moving forward, one of the things that we wanted to do was to survey our farmers market vendors and ask them about their revenue and sales in the 2019 season, but then also what would be the effect if we had a uh, diminished or even didn't have a 2020 farmers market season. So this is some of the data from that uh, survey. Uh, we can see we had a variety of vendors that participated in the survey. And from the 79 vendors that gave us the initial information, we saw that these 79 vendors um, were responsible for $2.2 million in revenue and an average of about $27,000, $28,000 per vendor. Um, these numbers are significant and uh, again, it represents a very small percentage of farmers market vendors across the state. The survey is still open. If you go to ilfma.org to our COVID-19 resource page, you'll see a link there. If you are a farmers market vendor, we would still appreciate having uh, your information contributed to the survey. But this is the question that I think just really hit home. It was, uh, 
what would be the impact on your business if there was no farmer's market in 2020? You can see that answers vary, you know, lose the connection with the community, two, it would be a huge impact, um, two, we do all of our sales through farmer's markets, uh, I think the Farmers Market Coalition cites that 25% of all farmers report that their sole source of sales is through farmers markets. And then even with um, other locations, the effect of losing a farmers market season would be devastating. So we decided it was really important that we look forward and um, Again, talk about the benefits of farmers markets. I think all of these, if you're in, involved in farmers markets, if you're a vendor, if you're a market manager, you know that these are the things that we talk about as being really key for farmers markets and what they contribute to the community. Um, particularly, there's food access, especially in vulnerable neighborhoods where there may be limited food access. Last year here in Illinois, we saw $800,000 worth of um, link and link match, WIC and senior farmers market coupons used. We know it supports the local economy, but I think in this season, as we look forward, I think the short supply chain is what our customers are really interested. We've seen an increase in interest in farmers market products, and we do think that there is a growing consumer demand. Uh, the Illinois Farmers Market Association um, we're pleased that here in Illinois that we are, farmers markets are considered essential. And you can see we got some clarification from the Illinois Department of Ag. And we did put together what we call the in and out toolkit, uh, the in and out farmers market toolkit. And that's available on our website. But what we wanted to do at this time was to talk about farmers markets that were already in operation or are currently operating. And as many of you start to think about the 2020 season, we're hopeful that some of the ideas and the innovations that have been uh, initiated across the state may serve as a template uh, for you as you consider uh, what it might look like for the 2020 season. So our first speaker today is Beth Walker. She is the Farmer's Market Manager at the Batavia Farmer's Market in Northern Illinois. And I will turn it over to Beth. Hi, um, the Batavia Farmer's Market right now, we, during the indoor season that goes from November to end of May, we were inside a restaurant, a bar, and we had our vendors set up there. And because of the the shutdown, we decided to go to a curbside pickup. So we adapted, um, we took the restaurant as our hub and we made it, uh, I got in contact with each of the vendors. I make a, a slide of their availability of products and how to contact them. And I make posts on social media. Um, we don't currently have a great website, so we've just been utilizing social media for this as well as eblast to our um, our email list. Each vendor makes uh, tells me how they are going to do it. They have their orders prepaid. They bring it to the market um, with the customer's name on it, and they set it out. And right now, it's not our our market is on the smaller side. We usually have between eight and ten vendors participating. And I've been setting the the product out. I'll, when the car pulls up, I run out to the car with my mask and gloves on. I get the person's name. And um, we go between, I'm sorry, I might have forgotten to say we're on the pre-order. Pre <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then I, I run the product out to the customer's car. And the customers have been really um, great. Some people will don't want any, any kind of interaction, so they'll just pop their trunk. And because everything's prepaid, it's worked out really well. The next slide, um, I've been working with Janie and uh, to because she comes to our market. We're lucky to have her come to our market. Um, this is an example of last week. That was the product that was available in this slide that says indoor uh, curbside market. So our the vendors have been so grateful. They love the the promotion, the flower people that you see here have been really busy. Um, 
the poultry person have been really busy. Customers love it, and it's growing every week. Uh, the nuts and bolts, I think I kind of explained mm -hmm. that. The, the vendors drop off their product. Some of them stay, some of them don't, depending on kind of how much uh, product they have to sell. And I, I'm not sure how many customers we get because it's growing, and our poultry lady does stay on site, and she um, serves all of her customers through her refrigerated van. Um, this right now it has not affected our budget. We've just been working on how we will um, project this going into the the new season. We do have quite a few vendors, and nobody's left. Um, the next slide is an example of Mary, who is our poultry vendor, and um, me putting a product in the customer's trunk just to eliminate any kind of customer interaction. Do you have any questions about this? Well, we'll save questions till the end, and we'll okay. take them all at and, once. And should I cover anything else, Janie? No? That I think that's great. That's great. All right. Perfect. I think it'll come out in the questions. Okay. All right. So next, we're really pleased to have uh, Ann Stahl Heber from the Carbondale Farmers Market. Uh, Carbondale uh, has a little bit different model. They actually initiated a drive-through market, and we'll let you let Ann tell you about that. Thank you. We've been uh, um, in business as a market since 1975, so. We are a pretty big market, we feel like, and we have a lot of support from the community, which has really helped us with the drive-through model. Um, we talked with our health department in Jackson County and got uh, sort of the rules and the regulations for what we needed to do. That has changed since we uh, initiated this three weeks ago, um, but right now we're continuing with the uh, drive-through model. Our, we encourage and we use Facebook mostly for our information to get it out. And that Facebook page has really grown a lot since we started this. Um, our orders are placed. We list the vendors that will be at the market on Saturday on Facebook with their phone number and encourage customers to call. Some of them do, some of them don't. The drive through they can roll their window down. We encourage all of the, all of the vendors have to wear mask and all of the vendors wear gloves or have hand sanitizer with them. Uh, the, most of the customers will roll the window down. Uh, they can see on the vendor's tables what is available and they order right then. And then one of the vendors takes the product to the trunk, hopefully, and the other vendor at the stall um, puts out a bucket or takes the money, and that's how the money is exchanged. Um, we do encourage pre-orders, so we're, we're hoping that will grow so people can have it ready when they come by the stand, and it makes it move a little faster. Um, most of the vendors are kind of um, wanting to get back to the way it used to be, which I can certainly understand. Um, they're cooperating with us. They're glad it's happening. I think each week the number of customers that are coming is growing. Um, so, And then that makes them feel better too. Uh, April 4th when we started, we had 152 cars go through our drive through April 11th, we had 245 cars go through the drive through And April 18th, we had 310 uh, cars. And most of them are one or two or three people in the car. Most of the drivers will wear masks, and a lot of them have gloves on. Um, the wait time can vary depending on when they come to the market. Our market is open from 8 to noon. We have a lot of drivers coming at 7.30, so we're opening early and going a little bit later. Um, it can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour to get through the market. Um, I just lost my screen, so I can't see my next question. <laughs> nuts and bolts? Oh, oh, nuts and bolts. We have a um, president of our market who is also a farmer and is very, very busy. He's been able to, in his mind, figure out how to do this drive-through. We're lucky we have a huge parking lot 
that we can spread out on and make a drive through that works. We can hold 60, 60 to 70 cars on the parking lot in the lineup before we get back out on the street. So that has been good for us in our, our uh, the nuts and bolts of how to make this work. We decided to separate the plants from the others, other products because it takes a little longer for the people going through to get their, pick out the plants they want. We're separating the meat vendors from the produce and hopefully that makes it go a little faster. Um, we have had 18 vendors. Normally we would have probably 30 vendors at the market at this time, but because of the spacing that we have to have with the health department and the um, layout, we're down to 18. So that is affecting our bottom line as far as our budget. And we'll just have to see how that works out. Um, well, I answered the how many customers and vendors participate. Let's see. Did I how leave many, anything out? How many volunteers uh, do you have helping you run this market? We have, um, well, the mar I'm the market manager and I am a paid, uh, I can get a salary. Um, Kurt, our president, and his family members, which three or four from his family, get there very, uh, two hours early and set up the cones and uh, ties off the uh, parking lot so people can find their way. We've um, painted signs, you know, so people can kind of follow this way or that way. Um, and then we have people strategically placed to kind of help with the traffic flow. So probably four or five are needed for this. And how are you dealing with uh, link snap sales at your market? Okay. We have our a little um, drive off with our EBT table and our person that does that. And so as they come in, the first thing they can do is go to the EBT if they need to, or they go straight, they can go through the plants and then they kind of weave around the parking lot to get to the meat and then the other produce. And we're doing the uh, double value coupons and the um, tokens. Right. All right. Yeah. Um. We um, really hope to get back to uh, foot traffic, but the way our market is set up, it, it's going to take some organization and probably a lot more volunteers to make that work. We don't have an entrance or an exit to work with, so we'd have to develop something for that. Um, I think the customers really like it. We kind of did an informal survey last Saturday, and most of them, or all of them that we talked to, were happy we were doing it, number one. And number two, they felt much safer doing it this way. And, you know, we've had an increase in numbers each week, and, you know, they have to wait about an hour probably to get through the whole line. But nobody seems to be minding right now. Some of the worries we have are right now we don't have a lot of produce, but when the vendors start coming, some of our vendors use a 30-foot space. And right now they're designated 10 feet. So when there are strawberries or asparagus or tomatoes, all of those different things start coming in, they're going to need more space. And we have to work, figure that out. Also, the driving through may take longer as more vendors have more products. So it's a work in progress. All right. And then your final slide with your plants. Um, yeah, that just shows one of our meat vendors. Um, they have that 10 foot space. The driver is close to the um, vendor, can roll her window down and give her order or tell her, get her pre order. And then we hope they pop their trunk. So the vendor who's handling the product can put it in the trunk while the other person that you don't see on that slide is working with the money. Um, we do do credit cards. They seem to take a little bit longer than the cash or the pre-orders, of course. So um, we just really are encouraging everybody to go as fast as they can. You want to be polite. You want to be friendly. You want to say hi to people you haven't seen all winter, but we really want to encourage um, people to keep moving through. Um, 
And I lost my slides again. What was the last slide? Picture of your plants. Oh, actually, that was, I think that is a picture of the lettuce that someone was selling in baggies. Is that right? There, that was on one. Now the next one is the, the flowers. Looks like petunias. Okay. Yes. Okay. That yeah. is in our plant section. We have five plant vendors that are coming right now. And that is uh, that does take some time. People are used to being able to browse and pick out what they want. So they just roll their window down and they ask questions and the uh, um, vendors work as fast as they can to get what the customer wants. Um, as far as we try to have everything bagged up, the, the one little, the picture with the lettuce that's in Ziploc bags, um, everything now is Nobody uses scales right now. It's all prepackaged or tomatoes that we're selling or in little boxes. So nobody has to, nobody can touch the produce for one thing, and it's all pre pre packaged and I guess pre priced. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, and we'll take questions like I said at the end. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to hear from Steph Funk and. She's at Plant Chicago and also with the Chicago Farmers Market Collective. Steph? Did we lose Steph? Steph, you may be muted. Try again. Steph, try again. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yay. Oh, we can hear. Awesome. Whew, I was getting nervous. Okay. <laughs> um, excellent. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I appreciate the, a little bit of time to talk about what Chicago is up to. So today I'm wearing, like, one and a half hats. Um, I'm representing the Farmers Market Collective. As I'm looking at the list of folks here, I see a bunch of folks that are part of it, uh, which is very exciting. But my, my full-time job, I work at an organization called Plant Chicago, and we manage a farmer's market in Back of the Yards, which is southwest Chicago. Um, right now, as far as I know, I don't think any markets in Chicago are active. I think the closest market that's open to us is in Evanston. Um, so what we do is, Janie, can we go to the next slide? Um, sure. All of the Chicago farmer's markets meet every other month. Um, we started this about two years ago which meant that we were in the perfect position with this health outbreak to really come together and do a lot of collective work. Um, if any Chicago farmers market managers are on this call and you haven't heard of us, you are totally welcome to join us. We have a meeting next Friday. I'm going to put my email in the chat, Steph at plantchicago.org. Um, but the route Chicago took was rather than rushing to open physical markets, because in an urban setting it is a little bit harder to enforce social uh, distancing guidelines, we opted to do an online farmer's market. Janie, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so instead of doing something in person, all of us went to our vendors to ask if any of them already had either pickup, delivery, or a monthly or weekly type delivery service available to customers. And we were able to compile eight different farmer's markets, all of their different pickup or delivery options, so that way Chicagoans could shop safely from their home. And then um, if you go to the Chicago Farmers Market Collective .org, the in the top right hand corner, you can access the online market. So it's structured where each market has its own little tab. So that way you can kind of like explore the city while in the, the safety of your own home and have products delivered to you. So the way the online market works is the market manager outside of creating it doesn't really have a, a role after that. Um, vendors will play, or sorry, customers place orders with vendors based on what options are available to them. So very true to the style of in-person farmers markets, each online market does have a different layout, it has different rules, it has different vendors, um, and different ways that people can order and then consequently get the items that they're ordering. Um, I will post a link to the online market in the chat so you guys can see, kind of get a better feel for what I'm talking about. Uh, Jamie, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, what was very exciting is because we were able to come together as a group, we got a lot of press attention pretty quickly. 
I think that if we were all to have independently done this and not put it in a collective website, we wouldn't have really gotten as much traction as we did. But as you can see, we had um, stories from ABC News, the Chicago Tribune, WTTW, um, and actually this slide is a little old. There, now there's like maybe 10 or so different articles. Um, if we could go to the next slide. I've got some data showing how the, the press impacted our, our farmer's market. Um, and since talking with people about this collective and how quickly we were able to pull all of this together, I've had a couple people comment on like, well, I don't really want to get lost in this collective. Like, I like being individual. I want my market to be seen. So, Janie, if we could go to the next slide. Um, this is my little transition into talking about Plant Chicago stuff. So this is the back end of my organization's website. And even though if you go on the online farmer's market, my market is the very last one on the page, um, you can still see there's a giant spike from when the collective got a lot of press attention. So again, I think that being a collective means that A, there's a strength in numbers, but B, a lot of the people that visit other markets around the city maybe never would have found my specific market if it wasn't for the fact that they were all grouped together in this really beautiful website. Um, excellent. So if we could go to the next slide, Janie. Um, one big issue that the farmers or the online farmers market doesn't address is organizations or companies that don't have the capacity to do their own deliveries and online orders, and also folks that have EBT or Link. Um, so to mitigate that issue, Plant Chicago every Saturday is acting as a curbside location for these Link produce boxes. So we partner with Experimental Station. Um, and during the year, like it, during a normal year, we're able to accept Link and then also offer a dollar for dollar match on fresh produce and vegetables. So we are buying these boxes from Urban Canopy at $40. Um, Jane, you actually have to go to the next slide. Um, this is what the box looks like. It's got a ton of food in it. Um, so we buy the box for $40, and anyone that has a Link card only needs to pay $20 for that box because then thanks to Experimental Station, the other half is matched. Um, so this program is a little bit more complicated than the online one. It's much more hands-on. Um, I don't have any volunteers yet. This is my third week doing the program. I think I do want to volunteer to help remind people of social distancing guidelines. But typically speaking, it, it could be done by one person. Um, Urban Canopy, the, the company we're working with to put these food boxes together, needs to know one week in advance how many boxes I need. So when folks come to pick up a box on Saturday, I ask them if they want a box for the next week. Um, and we also have an online store on our website where people can request, or they can email or text or call my personal phone to request a box. Um, and then folks come to my office between uh, 2 and 12 p.m. every Saturday, and I have a machine that I can process link transactions. I wear a glove and mask. I disinfect all of the machinery and the table before and after every single transaction. Um, and typically, it's, it's pretty quick. Uh, unfortunately, you're, we're not allowed to do link sales online or over the phone, which is why it, it prohibits us from doing an entirely no contact pickup. I know there's been a lot of conversation about allowing farmers markets to accept link online, so hopefully that changes soon. Um, but each interaction takes about like 90 seconds, I'd say. So it, it's not perfect, but I don't feel unsafe. Um, I haven't gotten any feedback from any of our customers. We have signage on our door. And we also, like grocery stores, have little lines on the sidewalk indicating six feet. So it, if there is a place where there's a bottleneck, um, we have folks waiting six feet apart. But that's pretty much all I have, uh, unless folks have questions. All right. Thanks, Steph. Lori, do we have any questions? Yes, you do. Uh, first one is, uh, what point of sale system do the growers use for prepayments? And I think a couple of them were uh, talked about, but if you want to expand on any of those, that would be great. I think specifically what they're looking for is, you know, how do the customers make the payments to those individual um, vendors? Do they do it through their Facebook? Is there something online for the markets, something like that? How about Beth? How do how do they make those pre pre order payments? That's a big question for a lot. There, I've had a couple of questions on that already. Sorry, I was on mute. I wasn't thinking. Uh, how are each vendor determines how they're going to do it? Um, I have some that use Square. I have some that use PayPal. A couple people do have 
checks that they drop off, um, but most of the vendors are paying ahead of time. I know that we use local, a couple vendors use local line. So it's really up to each vendor. Dan, do you have an answer for that? That's how it works down in Carbondale also. Uh, several of our vendors have uh, websites and, and on those websites they use PayPal or the Square. And Steph, do you have an answer for that too? Yeah, for the for the online markets, it, it is by vendor, and also since we offer pickup, delivery, and regular delivery, it, it it just totally depends by vendor. Right. One of the things that the Illinois Farmers Market Association, in partner with the Illinois Farm Bureau and Market Maker, uh, has available is the option through uh, creating a profile in Market Maker vendors and farmers markets have access to creating an online store if they don't already have one uh, with a vendor called local line i will be posting a um, zoom call that we had last friday afternoon about how to go through and set that up and what the different pricing structures are and just some questions like that so i think what we've seen is kind of a hodgepodge across the state as people are getting ready for the season i'm getting calls from many vendors that are looking to create an online store where they haven't had one before but currently many of the transactions that i'm seeing are informal transactions that are done by each vendor based on the way that they're used to taking um, credit you know at the farmer's market i pay you know, via Venmo or credit card or just any variety of things, but it's it's dependent on the individual vendor. Okay. Next question I have is, uh, do vendors only bring their pre-orders to market, meaning there's no day of sales occurring on any of the markets right now? Maybe, Ann, you could start with that. The Carbondale Farmers Market does have items on sale at the market um, and that's how most of our sales happen we do encourage the pre-orders because that can make uh, the transactions faster but uh, most people just roll their window down look out the window and um, see what's available and then choose what they want at the okay and then Beth do you want to answer Batavia? that yeah, yeah, in Batavia, the majority of the, the sales are pre-order. Um, I do have a flower vendor that will occasionally bring a couple extra bouquets, but, you know, they're selling out. And uh, so, yes, the majority are pre-order. Yep, and for the online market, all of it's pre-order um, since there isn't a physical location. And then with the link produce boxes, since I need to know a full week ahead of time to get from the suppliers, we do a pre-order system as well. The day of, I have zero boxes left to give out. So it's usually just collecting people's information and letting them know how to do it in the future. Uh, Steph, how many boxes are you going through in a week? This is week three. We started with 10. The last week was 15. This week is 16. And that's because we are running very short on funding. So we're trying to stretch our funds as long as we can. Um, but there is a, a lot of demand. OK. All right, Lori, back to questions. Okay. Um, the biggest question right now is, uh, where are you purchasing masks, sanitizers, and gloves? Are there any sources out there that, that uh, anybody has that uh, can help with this? We see a lot of homemade masks in Carbondale. And uh, we, too, are looking for hand sanitizer and more maybe official mask. Most of it's homemade. Uh, in Batavia, it's a, a hodgepodge. We have some that have uh, purchase masks and homemade masks. So, And uh, we do not have san hand sanitizer on site, but we use gloves. Yep, and in Chicago, the, the only time I'm using masks is for the link produce pickups a couple hours. My boss's mom handed me a mask, which was really sweet of her. And then Simple Green has one type of cleaning product that is that would kill Corona. I, I think we got it online. I think we had it before, honestly. Um, but if anyone was interested, I could look up the, the actual name of it. 
that's what we've been using. So in Car Carbondale and Batavia, are you providing them for your vendors or are they providing it for themselves? For themselves. In, Car in Carbondale, they all are providing them for themselves. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one of the big one is, is do all vendors uh, keep the cars on site and then vend out of them? or instead of having the booth set up, or how are your vendors handling their excess produce for the market? In, in Carbondale, um, normally the, the trucks would stay at the site where the vendor was setting up, but because of the way we have to do it with the spacing and they only are getting a 10 foot space, they have to unload and then they have to move their vehicles away from the farmer's market in a, in a separate parking lot. And it, right now, um, because of the weather and the early season, a lot of the vendors are able to get all of their product out and move their cars and it's not a problem. The problem will be in a few weeks when they need more space because they'll have a lot more produce. Mm. Okay. Anybody else want to answer from any of the other markets? In Batavia, we, we don't really. Most of the vendors drop off their prepaid items and I deliver them to the car, but we are a smaller market. So there is no setup. But in the, in the, in the outdoor season, we will have each vendor in their own spot. Okay. All right. Another question, are other markets only allowing essential vendors in this season? I'm not sure what they mean by essential vendors. Um, probably about crafts more than anything, I'm thinking. So are your markets only crafters? At the Carbondale Farmer's Market, we are limiting it, it to essentials, which is basically food items and plants. Uh, we have several jewelry and craft people who would like to come when when it's more open, but right now, um, because of space and um, I think we're supposed to just do essential items. And so that's what we're doing. Also, we are concerned about how long it takes for the drivers, the, the customers to get through the market. And I think it would be difficult to buy jewelry or craft while sitting in the car. I just yeah, this is, oh. Go ahead. Is this is Paula Graver with the Buffalo Grove Farmers Market. I have a, a, a distillery in Wheeling, Illinois that's willing to sell the farmers market the sanitizers in gallon jugs, forty dollars a jug. Okay, thank you. What's the name of that distillery? Why don't you go ahead and put that in the chat? That'd be great. Okay. It's Windy City Distillery. Um, I can send you an email with the information and the contact, but I spoke to him yesterday. He's willing to sell this at this price to the farmer's market. Why don't you go ahead and put that in the chat box for everyone? That would be great. Okay. I'm, I'm not on the computer. I couldn't get on. I'm on the phone right now. I'll do it a little bit later. Thank you. Great. All right. Okay. Um, so let's go to the next one. Gloves versus no gloves. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has recommended wearing face coverings in certain settings. And do gloves offer any meaningful protection from the coronavirus? Uh, Lori, this is Deborah, and that I um, put the question in there. Um, I was a farm market manager in Springfield, and just to use an example, and I don't know, many of you have worked in food service before, you'll see people with gloves on and then doing things with their hands that, you know, they shouldn't do. So, for example, we had our health inspectors walking through, a woman had a smoothie booth, one of her staff members with her gloves on reached in to adjust her underwear and then proceeded to take her hand and, and reach for the fresh fruit to put in the smoothie because she had a glove on. And so the, I think the thing that's happening with the CDC and others, they're saying, um, you know, we'll, 
you know, the virus can stay on gloves, just like any other kind of germs do too, right? So Janie, she is, in, you know, involved in teaching nutrition and stuff, so maybe Janie could answer this too or others, but I think, um, you know, the idea is, is the face masks are the most important thing, and then that people, according to the CDC, should wash their hands with water and then uh, sand, hand, sand hand sanitizers also. Yeah, that's that's a good point, and I, and I think that um, one of the things that we have an opportunity to do with our vendors and the people that are attending the markets is to remind them that just because you have these protections on, you still have to take the same level of care and precaution not to use your hands in a way that are going to, you know, you're not going to cough on them. You're not going to touch things that you shouldn't touch with food or whatever the case may be. So I do think that that's an opportunity for education. But I also think it's also um, a level of opportunity for the customer to feel customers and vendors to feel a little more secure. Um, but again, that's probably an opportunity for education with vendors and also with customers. And I do think having regular um, one of the things in the in and out market guidance that is there is to uh, encourage that every stall, every vendor have a hand washing station or appropriate sanitizer so that there can be taking on and off gloves, washing hands and going back to it. So again, that's probably our next level education is then once we um, get a little more operational is what are some of those best practices for the market. But, um, but definitely encouraging um, our market volunteers, vendors, uh, all to use the appropriate techniques that are recommended by the CDC. And one other uh, item, some of the smaller farmers markets, maybe down in Southern Illinois, are, are looking to uh, continue with having s increased spacing between the booths and uh, allowing people to come into the marketplace. Um, I would, uh, part of the uh, rules and uh, suggestions that uh, in that toolkit from the Illinois Farmers Market Association is to maybe have some additional hand washing stations within the market, um, uh, being able to mark off uh, spacing so people are aware of the six foot social distancing um, and uh, making sure that your vendors may have or might have hand washing stations and gloves available uh, during the market day as well. Yeah, this is Janie. I would just really recommend that um, if you're interested that the toolkit um, may be of benefit to you because it just sets out some pretty standard, straightforward guidelines. Um, your local unit of government or your health department are your local regulators and of course they have the final say but one of the reasons that we did this was to again to set the vision that we can have farmers markets in this season these are some great examples of curbside of drive-through of online pickup of csa models there are going to be a lot of different models that take place across the state as the season starts to ramp up but i think the main thing is is we not want to make sure that we are doing appropriate things to ensure that we have the opportunity to operate, um, that our officials and our communities are comfortable with our practices and are comfortable with the methods that we're using. And also, I think it's really important, we can't um, dismiss the comfort of the customer. So if the customer comes and sees inappropriate activities on the behalf of other other customers or vendors or volunteers, then uh, that may do a lot to um, influence whether they come back and whether they continue to sell that way. But again, I think this is our opportunity to uh, promote local food, the short um, supply chain, the limited number of hands that touch it, and then to use our best practices, whatever method uh, you and your community have come up with to move your farmer's market forward. Because like I said in the beginning, the data I think really showed us compellingly that farmers markets are essential, not only within the governor's executive order, but they're essential to our producers and to our vendors as we move forward into 2020. Okay, thank you, Jane. Another question, uh, the idea is to go cashless this market season. 
Uh, but our market, uh, like most, uses tokens for all of our link users. Uh, any suggestions on how to handle that going forward? Anyone deal with the link at those markets? Ann or Beth, Steph? Well, I'll just mention that we don't have the guidance up on our website yet, but we are going to be uh, taking some guidance from uh, the Michigan Farmers Market Association on how to sanitize tokens and uh, other other items that you might use for your link uh, double value system. And then we also have guidance that's been written for us uh, in partnership with LinkUp Illinois about potentially using more of the chit or the paper system so there are no tokens. And so those will be added to uh, the ILFMA website shortly. But uh, our, we'll, we'll take some good practices from our partners and put those on as well. Okay. I'm not I'm not sure how in Carbondale we're sanitizing the tokens, but I know that our treasurer who handles them yeah. has a method um, that she uses to sterilize them. Okay. So another question I think we've talked about already, uh, but when people order online, do the orders go directly to the vendors or it's at the market manager's responsibility to relay the orders? I believe we mentioned that um, the market um, vendors are taking their own orders um, and distributing them as the customers come through. Am I correct on that? Yep, yes. that's right. Yep. Um, I would. I know we'll probably talk about this in a second, but I would also invite you to um, attend the webinar on Friday where the downtown Bloomington curbside market will be presenting and they have um, a curbside market, but they're doing um, aggregating of the products. So it may be something you wanna tune into to hear some of their best practices. Mm -hmm. I believe she started that just recently, didn't she, Jane? Yes, yes, last week was their first market. Yep, so she'll have some really good information to share, I'm sure. Yes, exactly. Okay, for those markets who have moved from indoors to outdoors during this time, how are you deciding when it's safe to move back indoors? I don't know if there's any guidelines on that from CDC, but if anybody has a comment on that. In Batavia, we're not planning on moving back indoors this season just because our art art dome mer art outdoor market starts May 30th. Okay. All right, that sounds great. Uh, let's see. Okay, question is, which is best to use, gloves or hand washing and or sanitizer? So let allow me to address this. Um, this is Lori. I am a, a food safety instructor for the state of Illinois. Um, with FISMA. Um, the recommendations through the Food Safety Modernization Act states that if you are going to use gloves that you must wash your hands before you put the gloves on. Anytime you use the bathroom, anytime you touch your face, change the gloves, you take the gloves off, uh, before you put fresh ones on, you wash your hands again. When I instruct the vendors for FISMA trainings, we state that hand washing and is uh, primary over sanitizers. The problem with sanitizers is if you have dirty hands and you put sanitizer on your hands to, to get them clean, you're only sanitizing the dirt that's on there. You still have problems with dirty hands, even if with the sanitizer. So I recommend that people go ahead and wash your hands. That's one of the reasons why we suggest that Growers have, or the vendors have, hand washing stations available. Um, just a five gallon bucket with paper towels, soap, uh, catch basin for the water, um, and have that at your market booth. So if you ever have to take the gloves off, you can wash your hands and then put the gloves back on. Now you can wash your hands and then put a sanitizer over that just as a, as a precaution and do it that way and then glove up, that's fine. 
the, but if anybody has any other comments on that, feel free to chime in. Okay. So next question, does anyone have food trucks at their market? Ann or Beth, Steph? Uh, we, we've had, we have had food trucks in the past, but, but we are not now. So. We don't have any in the indoor season. So yeah, from we were planning on still having. Go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so Chicago, the Chicago Farmers Market Collective put together some language for prepared food vendors and non-food vendors to to let them know that unfortunately we can't have them at the market this year. Instead, we're going to use the online market and try to direct people to ways that they can support those vendors outside of the farmers market. Um, but we want to reserve space for produce and and value added stuff. Bakeries will have, just not not ready to eat food or like soaps or handicrafts. Okay. So, are you the three of you looking at not having the ready to eat food vendors all season, or if they're if it's um, pulled that uh, the the uh, governor's proclamation is pulled and the markets open up totally? Later, will you, or are you haven't thought about that yet? Batavia is on pause right now. We're waiting to see what the next proclamation is. And we were talking about food vendors. If they're going to prepare food, it has to be like a takeout where it is a takeout container where you're not to eat it on site. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is that. Go ahead. No, go ahead, please. Well, I was just I was going to add that in Carbondale, we're just going to wait and see um, before we talk about food at the market. Okay. And, and this is Steph from Chicago. In the language that we wrote for the collective, it states that we're not accepting any new prepared food vendors, but if the situation arises where it becomes safe for folks to come, then we'll welcome our, our previous vendors back. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, what about bakeries? It's the next question. Um, baked goods. How are you handling those vendors? In Carbondale, we do have several bakers and they are selling at the drive through market. All their uh, baked goods are wrapped and um, on display. People drive by and choose which breads or cookies or whatever they want and it's treated just like another product. Our baked goods are uh, uh, ordered ahead of time and wrapped in, in, ba in bags be when they're dropped off at the market. Okay. What about sampling? Are you allowing sampling at all at your markets? No, nope. you're not. It's probably a good idea. <laughs> Go ahead, Jane. I, one of the things about prepared food is I think we sometimes don't think about um, all the processes involved in that, that it's the juggling of things and then people's hands become contaminated and then there's the hand to mouth motion. I mean, there's so many things and then we have contaminated trash we have to deal with. So um, I think in this iteration, it was recommended in the in and out uh, guidance to not have prepared foods on site just or samples just because it makes it so much easier for ensuring this, uh, there isn't contamination going on in the market. Okay. I do have another question uh, with, in regard to excess produce, generally at the markets at the end of the day, some people donate to food pantries. Uh, the latest government relief program talks about using local food pantries. Does anyone have any info more information on this? Are you, are you planning on donating or how you hand, do you know how your vendors are handling the excess produce? In Carbondale, uh, right now, we do not have any excess produce. Um, so that's not an issue, but uh, what we do once the produce starts really coming in is we, uh, food pantry comes every uh, Saturday after the market is over and collects food from all the vendors and fills a truckload 
of food that goes to the local food pantries. And we'll do that again once it starts coming in. Okay. All right. Looks like there's some uh, comments as far as certain public health departments throughout Illinois and what they are allowing at the market and what they're not. Um, so let's see what else we have here. Food trucks. Yep. Looks like we have all the questions that are in the chat box at this time. Um, does May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, since we do drive through and we do exchange money, cash money. Uh, we have one vendor who is designated to handle the money and they wear gloves. And do they need to uh, do anything with those gloves after they have a customer and then move on to the next customer? I know that, I'm not sure. Okay, so glove usage is to help to reduce the cross-contamination that can occur. If this person is only handling the cash, gloves do not need to be changed from one person to the next. Um, okay. I would suggest that if, you have, um, if you're uncomfortable with using one set of gloves throughout the whole day for that person that's only handling the money, uh, make it a regulation that they change the gloves every half hour or hour or however you want to set it up for the market. If someone has okay. some additional information, please go ahead and, and let us know in the chat box. We Does do that... have a creative way one of the vendors is doing. He has a, uh, the vendor who's in charge of the money has a bucket. She holds the bucket out to the driver. They put the money in the bucket. And then if they need change, they get change from another bucket of money that has not just been handled or touched. That is a, a, a one way or of taking care of that. The other one that I heard of is that some vendors are uh, accepting the money but are not giving change out. So that is also yeah. another option, um, depending on how you want to handle your own uh, revenue basis for your own uh, booth itself. Um, but there are different ways of doing that. Um, but I would suggest that using some sort of gloves or hand protection on that is going to be beneficial and only have one person handling the money if at all possible. And that, that's, that's what we're doing. That's the requirement. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there is a comment in here. It says one of our vendors who come from Wisconsin has sent a message stating that their Saturday market, each vendor must have two people, one to handle nothing but money and one to handle the produce. So that is something that the market has requested of the vendors. Um, so that would be something that you can incorporate uh, into yours as well. Yeah, that's also part of the, the ILFMA guidance is there should be one person for handling the money or transactions, even credit cards, and another person for handing, handling product. Great. And the second that's department. That's what our health department. <clears throat> yeah, local jurisdictions have the final say. We just tried to make uh, guidance that we felt or that was reviewed that um, definitely stayed within the, the limits of what's required on the state level, but then also look for ways to try and build customer um, satisfaction and feeling of safety at the market. And then also, one of the things I often don't hear about is we're always talking about public safety. I'm worried about our vendors' safety. I want to make sure that they're safe as well in this, in this, um, in this space. Right. We had one other comment that says that their health department has recommended that vendor tables should be wiped down every two hours. Uh, cleaning and sanitizing your tables is going to be essential, especially if you have a walk-in market where people are coming in and they're actually purchasing at the table itself. Um, I would suggest that you uh, set up some sort of guidelines that you clean and sanitize your tables uh, like every two hours or every hour, depending on how busy you are. Um, and making sure that you keep the produce uh, back further away from that transaction table. 
I believe that's all the questions that we have. Um, so what I'd like to do, since it is 1 o'clock, I said I'd like to thank our presenters, Jane Maxwell, Steph Funk, Beth Walker, and Ann Stahlherber for the great presentation and sharing their expertise with us today. I'd last, like to also thank everyone for joining us uh, for this webinar. I hope you receive some information that will help you with your markets during the 2020 market season. I'd also like to remind you of the second webinar presentation scheduled for this coming Friday, April 24th at noon. We'll be presenting Catherine Dunlap from the downtown Bloomington Farmers Market. She has coordinated her efforts in developing and maintaining safe guidelines for the Bloomington Market, which she is willing to share with the group. If you have already signed up for this webinar, you will receive a second Skype link in your email box. These webinars will be recorded and a link to the presentation will be sent out to you shortly. Thank you again for joining us today. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.